entitled the lesson, David Waits on the Lord to Become King. And one of the great lessons that comes out of this study is patience. I tend to be impatient. I want things, I need things, now, not tomorrow, not manana. And so we see David's patience. David is going to wait on the Lord to become king. He's not going to force himself to become king. He's not going to usurp the place of others and step on others to become king. He's not going to kill people and have some sort of coup and seize the throne for himself. God ordained that David be king. Samuel went and anointed David to be king. David did not choose himself to be king. God did. And so David is going to wait patiently for God to act for him to become king. So there's a great lesson on patience here. There's also lessons on peace, where David chooses to live as peacefully as possible with all people. And we'll get to that as we go through the study. But let's notice, number one, David seeks God's will. David really wants to do God's will. He wants to know what the Lord wants him to do. He wants to be fully aligned with God's plans and purposes. So if you're there now in 2 Samuel, notice chapter 2. 2 Samuel chapter 2. And let's just begin reading in verse 1. This is 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. And it happened after this, that is after the death of Saul and his sons, that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? Question mark. And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? And he, the Lord, said to Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carabalite. Verse 3. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household. So they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. So now Saul has died. Remember, Saul was the king. And Saul kept seeking David's life. Saul is now dead. Many of Saul's sons are also dead. So the first thing David says is, Lord, what shall I do? David is truly seeking God's will. Shall I go up to one of the cities? Where shall I go? He knows God has anointed him to be king, but David wants the peace of mind and the assurance that God is the one putting him on the throne of Israel. Not David scheming and conniving and manipulating his own circumstances for his own selfish ends. David wants to know that he has done the will of God. And then notice verse 4. Verse 4. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and to bury him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I also will repay you this kindness because you have done this thing. Now therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant. For your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Let's stop right there. Notice the last words. David says, the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. So far, David is only ruling and reigning over the tribe of Judah. It will be some years before all Israel rallies around his kingship. So David is going to have to be patient and wait for the Lord to do things in God's timing. And notice here, David pronounces a special blessing on the men of Jabesh Gilead because they had the boldness to go into Philistine territory and reclaim the bodies of Saul and his sons and give them a burial. Remember last week we learned that David had no ill will he harbored no grudges and no resentment against Saul. And yet he could have easily done so because Saul sought his life time and time again. All right, let's go to chapter 5, if you will. Chapter 5 and verse 19. Chapter 5 and verse 19. 
So sometime later, David finds himself having to go up against the Philistines. The Philistines are preparing to make war against David, the new king. And so again, David inquires of the Lord. He doesn't want to do anything without consulting God. And that's a good example for us to follow as well. So notice, if you will, chapter 5, verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 19. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hands. Again, David consults the Lord. And then if you're there, just notice verse 23. Just skip down to verse 23. Same chapter, chapter 5 and verse 23. And when David, verse 23, and when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go up. Circle around behind them, that is behind the Philistines. So don't go up directly to face the Philistines head on. God says, rather, circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. So it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. So again, David seeks to do God's will. He doesn't just assume that he knows what's best. He asks the Lord. There is a humble man who really wants to fulfill the will of God. All right, number two. And I have quite a bit of subtitles. If I don't be overwhelmed with all the subtitles. This is just basically working our way through chapter three. So David wants peace not bloodshed. When David becomes king, he wants to do so peacefully. He doesn't want anyone to be killed because he becomes king. He doesn't want bloodshed. He doesn't want some sort of political coup. He wants everything to be done peacefully and in the will of God and in God's timing. So in chapter 3, at first people are not rallying around uh, David. Uh, Abner, who is the former commander of Saul's army and probably Saul's right-hand man, uh, wanted to make Ishbosheth, Saul's son, king. And he did. He set up Ishbosheth as king in other parts of Israel. And then finally, Ishbosheth offended Abner. And Abner said, okay, I'm going to go give my loyalty to David. So Abner is used by the Lord to go to David and say, David, even though I'm, I'm the former commander of Saul's army, I am going to pledge my loyalty to you, David, and I'm going to go out and rally all Israel to come under you as their king. Well, in a previous battle, one of Joab's brothers, now keep in mind Joab, I'm trying to explain this and summarize things, Joab was, you might say, David's um, commander of the army. And so one of Joab's brothers in a previous battle was pursuing Abner. And Abner kept turning around and saying, stop, stop pursuing me. I don't want to have to kill you. Stop pursuing me. He gave him many, many, many chances to turn aside, but this brother of Joab wouldn't turn aside. Finally, out of fear for his own life, Joab killed him. So now Joab, keep in mind, Joab, a little angry with Abner. Joab doesn't trust Abner when Abner went to talk to David. So unbeknown to David, Joab goes out, schedules a private meeting with Abner, and kills Abner. Now, what do you think David thinks? David is very, very unhappy and displeased. He doesn't want bloodshed. He wants to become king peacefully. Joab took matters into his own hand and went out and killed Abner, and then David declares a day of fasting and mourning for Abner. And David recognizes Abner as a great man, is very sorry that he was killed. So that's the upshot of chapter 3. David does not want bloodshed, he wants peace. And remember we read earlier in Romans chapter 12, that verse that says, uh, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all people. 
That's the goal of our Christian lives, at least one of the goals, one of the commands that we have, and that's one of the ways that we show love for all people. So letter A, Abner wants to bring Israel to David. So if you will, look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, this is letter A, chapter 3, verse 12. We'll just read some of these verses. We may not read every, every verse here, but let's just look at some of them. So chapter 3, verse 12. Then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David, saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. And David said, Good, I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. So David is happy. God is going to work through Abner to rally all Israel around David as their new king. David just wants to see his wife that Saul promised to him, Michal, again. So letter B. Letter B. Abner goes to work and he convinces Israel to make David their king. And I believe Abner is very sincere here. Notice verse 17. Verse 17. Now Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel saying... In, the, in time past, you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then, do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people, Israel, from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. So Abner went out. He went around throughout the tribes of Israel, and he convinced them all to make David king. You know you want David to be your king. You're impressed with David. You know it's God's will, so just do it. All right, let her see. Joab comes along. Let her see. Joab doesn't trust Abner. If you will, let's get down to verse 22. Verse 22. At that moment, the servants of David and Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron. For he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. Notice that. David sent Abner away in peace. Three times in this passage we read that David sent Abner away in peace. That's what David wants, peace. Now verse 23. But when Joab and all the troops that were with him had gone, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he sent him away, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away? And he has already gone. Surely you realize that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you, to know you're going out and you're coming in, and to know all that you are doing. Joab doesn't trust Abner. David trusts Abner. David has sent Abner away in peace. So we read in the following verses, uh, Abner goes out, he goes on his way to do his job to bring all Israel to David. Joab catches up with him. Joab says, hey, let's go over here, partner, and let's have a little conversation. And then that's when Joab stabs Abner in the stomach and Abner dies. Well, when David gets wind of this, David is very, very unhappy. Letter D, Joab kills Abner. Letter E, David mourns for Abner. David is not pleased. If you will, notice verse 33. Verse 33. And the king, that is King David, sang a lament over Abner and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet put into fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. So David acknowledges that Abner died not, you might say, as a hero out fighting battles for the Lord. He died at the hands of wicked men. He didn't need to die, and David did not want him to die. So notice now the next, oh, let's continue reading. The end of verse 34, then all the people wept over him, that is, over Abner again. And when all the people came to persuade David to eat food while it was still day, David took an oath, saying, God do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. Now all the people took note of it and it pleased them. 
since whatever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people in all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's intent to kill Abner, the son of Nair. That's the message David wanted everyone to know. David did not want Abner killed, and David is sorry to see him gone. So again, David wants there to be no bloodshed. He wants to become king peacefully. And letter F, letter F. Well, by and by, some men conspired to have Ishbosheth killed. Now, who was Ishbosheth? I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Ishbosheth was Saul's son. And remember, David harbors no resentment, no ill will. He holds no grudges against Saul. So when David learns that two men conspired to kill Ishbosheth in his own house while he was on his bed, David is very, very angry. And as king, he needs to exercise justice. They committed murder against an innocent man, so David has those two men executed because they killed an innocent man in cold blood in his own house, in his own bed. So again, David wants peace, not bloodshed. All right, let's get down to point number three. Point number three. No sub points here, just plain and simple. Point number three, David waits for Israel to make him king. Now you remember the tribe of Judah has accepted David to be king, but the rest of Israel has not. Abner's good intent was to go out and rally Israel to come under the kingship of David. So finally that happens. Notice now chapter 5. Chapter 5. Then all the tribes, this is verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1, then all the tribes of Israel came to David and Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. So notice David did not go to the elders of Israel and, and plead with them and say, well, how, how long are you going to take to make me king? Hurry up, make me king. David patiently waited. The elders of Israel, they came to David at Hebron. And they said, we acknowledge God's plan. We know God's will for your life. We know it's God's purpose to make you king. And so we're going to do just that. David had to wait a long time. Notice verse uh, 4. So David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years, six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. So about seven years went by when, when David was only king over Judah. Seven years. He had to wait almost seven years before God finally moved Israel to make him king over the whole entire country. And then, of course, he reigned in Jerusalem another 33 years for a total reign in Judah and over Israel for 40 years. David was a patient man. David may have been, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years old when Samuel came to anoint him to be the next king. And then David had to run from Saul for, I don't know, 12, maybe 10 years, 12 years, maybe more. He had to run from Saul all that time to save his life. And then finally, the, the, the tribe of Judah makes him king. Judah acknowledges him to be, to be king, but not Israel. So then he has to wait another seven years for God to work in the elders of Israel to finally let David be king over all Israel and over all Judah. I believe God wants to teach me patience. And you, patience. We need patience. We have to wait on God to see what God wants to be done. And we have to wait God, for God to fulfill his plans and his purposes with us as Christians. One final point, and then we'll make some more uh, application at the end. So number four. So what's the outcome of all this? Well, it's very good for David. So David now has the confidence that God has made him king. 
And that's important to David. If David's going to reign as king over all of Israel, man, that's a big job. I mean, imagine being president of a country. Well, it's kind of like David being president over Israel. That's a big job, a lot of responsibilities. He's going to have to be very careful what he does and what he doesn't do. He's going to need to rely on the Lord. So now David can go into his job knowing that it was God who made him king. He didn't appoint himself. He didn't try to force himself into kingship by killing people and, and jockeying for position. No, the Lord made David king. So let's read about this now. Notice chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 10. Chapter 5 and verse 10. So at this point, David has gone up to Jerusalem. He's now residing in Jerusalem. So David went on and became great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. Boy, if you're a new king, you'd want to know that. That God is with you. Because you're going to need all the help you can get from God. So that's good news to David. Notice verse 11. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David. And cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons. And they built David a house. So there's a very a, a great gesture of goodwill from the king of Tyre. David, we're happy that you are now king over Israel, the covenant people. And we're going to honor you by sending you wood and uh, uh, people who can build. And we're going to build you a nice palace for yourself. So then verse 12. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. And that he, the Lord, had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. David has the peace of mind and the assurance and the confidence in his heart that the Lord has made him king. David is right where God wants him to be. He has waited upon the Lord to act in his time, not David's time, in his time to become king. So some lessons we learn is patience. God, give me patience. And Lord, help me to wait on you for you to fulfill your plans and your purposes. Now, we as Christians, we're waiting for the Lord to come. We wait for the second coming. In the meantime, we need to persevere. Uh, we're also, uh, we, we know that God is working to transform us into Christ's likeness. So we, so we just patiently wait on the Lord to fulfill his will and his plans and purposes in us to make us more and more holy to make us more and more like Christ, and to use us to honor Him until the day Jesus comes. Another lesson we learn is we need to live in peace. David tried to live in peace as much as possible. Sometimes men around him took matters into their own hands and did some killing that David did not approve of. Sometimes when people murdered members of Saul's family, David had to rise up and wear the hat of judge and execute justice. David strived for peace. So should I, and so should you. We should strive for peace in all of our relationships. And then I think here, hidden in the text, is the, the idea of hope. We just, even as David lived in hope each day that someday God would make him king, someday God's plan and purpose would be fulfilled. Even though he had to run from Saul for many years, uh, even though only Judah at first acknowledged him to be king, even though it took a long time David had to live in light of that great hope that God would one day make him king. So we also live in hope. We live in hope because God has made great promises to us. God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God has given us his Holy Spirit to be with us forever. Jesus said, I'm coming back. And just as you have seen me go into heaven, so also I will also return. Uh, God has also promised us a, a resurrection of the body. So God has made all of these promises, and we as God's people live in hope. Even as David lived in hope, we live in hope. Now one final thought, and I'm done. What David didn't realize right now at this juncture in the unfolding of events in his life is that God was going to make a promise to him that one day, David, you would have a descendant who would sit on your throne and rule over the house of Jacob forever and ever and ever, and of his kingdom there would be no end. Boy, God has great plans for David. And I know we don't compare ourselves to David, but God has great plans for each and every one of us. God has great plans for me and for you in relation to our Lord Jesus Christ, the greater son of David, Jesus the Messiah.
So let's realize this morning how special you are to God. You are his redeemed people, and you are those who belong to David's greater son, Jesus, the Messiah. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for these moments to meditate on your word. And there's always many lessons to be learned as we study scripture. Lord, teach me patience. Help me to wait on you. Help me just to do your will. Help me never to become impatient and find an excuse to disobey you. And Lord, help me to live in peace with everyone. Help me to conduct myself in such a way that peace comes easy. And then, Lord, help me to live in hope. You've made great promises. Help me to persevere and wait for you to fulfill those promises in your time. May others see the life and the love of Jesus living in me. I pray in the name of Jesus, my Savior. Amen. Amen. May God bless his word to all of you this morning.